privilege to be here at the Jordan Street Seventh Day Adventist Church. And if the musician can continue to play until after our scripture reading, I would appreciate that. Uh, I'm a believer. Uh, I'm a believer that when individuals come together in order to celebrate the goodness of God, God desires to restore our understanding of ourselves. If there is an issue that all of us have, there's a crisis. It is an identity crisis. And the enemy, through pain, through suffering, through embarrassment, and even disappointment, has caused many of us to forget that we are the imprint of God's image on the earth. Now that's a special title, to say I am God's imprint. It's a special calling to wear that imprint. And that's what the Imprint Initiative is all about. It's about reestablishing our identity in God. Hoping that that will help you to feel pretty encouraged about going out and introducing others Amen. to the same identity. As God leaves an imprint on you, he desires to cause you to leave an imprint on the world. Amen. And that is how this gospel message works. And so we are we're excited to come to you on behalf of the South Central Conference and say God wants to create an imprint here at Jordan Street. And that imprint is supposed to be so powerful Amen. that it places an imprint on the city of Pensacola. Amen. We still have a God that wants you to take cities. That's what I read about in the Old Testament. A God that wants his people to take cities. And if we would just believe that the imprint of God is in us, he would empower us to place that imprint on the entire city of Pensacola. Amen. And if you are a guest coming from a different city, whether it be nearby or far, or far away, God wants you to take over your city. Amen. I know it sounds big. I, sound, I know it sounds impossible. But that's why we have promises like, but with God, all things Amen. are possible. He's still a city-taking God Amen. and a city-building God. And he needs you to join in his army. And so we're excited to celebrate Imprint. We'll do that in part one here this morning. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will reestablish identity in this space. And then this afternoon, we'll move to part two. How you can build a youth ministry in your local church that can begin the process of taking over cities for God. And so that's part one and part two. Part two begins at three o'clock right here in the sanctuary. And we'll spend a couple hours together just looking at youth ministry and how we can structure it to take over cities. Then we'll have AYS brought to us by the George Street Youth Ministry Team. Elder Tinsley, I just want to thank you for blessing us and allowing us to come and be a part on today and working with Sister Jewel. Can you say, hey, Jewel? Hey, Jewel. No, I need everybody to say, hey, Jewel. Hey, Jewel. Listen, Jewel is the machinery in our office. Wherever we go, Jewel prepares the way for us. And I want to thank her publicly and in your hearing for her not only research prowess, but also her execution ability. She just has a high level of execution and drive. And this day is uh, because of her willingness to sacrifice on behalf of God for you and the surrounding churches. So I want to thank Jewel and also thank Pastor Fontes for accompanying me and pulling away from his church assignment to be a part of this initiative. Uh, to the other clergy that are here, I see some good friends. Uh, uh, Chaplain Lister, Pastor Lister, as well as Pastor Johnny. It's good to see you guys here as well. And then I want to thank your own pastor, Pastor Knight. Now, now, everybody in here knows that he needs his own Netflix special. Everybody knows that. The dude is just a walking comedian. And uh, Pastor Knight is one of the people in ministry, whether you laugh at his jokes or not, he is one of the people in ministry that remind me we serve a God that laughs. Amen. A lot of us see a God that scowls, that frowns, that punishes, that disciplines. But few of us have ever met the God that laughs. Well, I believe Pastor Knight has. And that is why he feels so liberated to move not only with laughter, but also a deep care and affection for his church. So I want to thank you for letting me stand in your stead today and to present the gospel as the Spirit has given it to me. Now, if you're excited about the preaching of God's word, I need you to say, I'm here for that. I'm here for that. That sounds good. I need you to turn in your Bibles to Psalms 139. We're only going to take on three verses, and we're going to do it awkwardly today, okay? So I want you to fasten your seatbelts. It'll be a little different, but I do pray that at the end of the preaching of God's word, you feel a restoration of your identity sweep through your mind and overtake your soul. 
That is Psalm chapter 139. And we're just reading three verses there, verse 14, 15, and 16. That's Psalms 139, verses 14 through 16. If you're there, say, I'm good. It reads, thank you for making me. I'm reading in the New Living Translation to deepen the impression of understanding. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. In other versions, it says, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. Verse 15 reads, you watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. It's very important. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb. Verse 16, well, finale there. You saw me before I was born. Watch this. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day of my life had been lived. Did you hear that? Every day of my life was recorded in your book. This is while I was being formed in the womb. Every day was already seen by God. And every moment was laid out before you lived a single day. I want to speak to you underneath the title. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Heavenly Father, may everything heard be deeply understood. In Jesus' name, amen. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We're going we're gonna to start off, as I said, a little awkward. And usually at this point of the message, the speaker would jump immediately into an anecdote or story. Other preachers decide at this point to draw your attention back to the scripture and to expound more on the context of what you just read. However, I believe the proof of this message is not found uh, in the book primarily, nor in a story from someone's life. The proof of this text is actually found on the palm of your hand. And so at this time, I want you to pull out your thumbs and I want you to look at the lighter side of your thumb. This is the side of your thumb opposite of the side with a nail. This is just the flesh side of your thumb. And I want you to turn it towards your attention. And I want you to follow the ringlets of your thumb. Every thumb has lines on it. Follow the ringlets of your thumb and try to find where those ringlets end somewhere around the center of your thumb. Now, most fingerprints, thumbprints, they end center and to the left or center to the right or center just above or center just to the south. I want you to follow those ringlets until you find where those ringlets end somewhere around the center of your thumb. When is the last time you took in your own thumbprint? <laughs> follow those ringlets. Okay, I found mine. Did you find yours? Now, I need you to breathe while you're doing this. Some people are about to faint in here. You are, you are concentrating so intently. Breathe and. Yep, I found it in on both thumbs. Mine is just south and to the right of center. I don't know where yours is. I don't know if you found it yet. Keep looking. Keep looking. Your looking won't distract you because your looking is actually deepening the impression of what we just read. Do you realize that no one else's thumbprints have been arranged like that before in Earth's history? Do you also realize that no one's thumbprints will ever be arranged like that in Earth's future? For the short amount of time that you are here on the planet, this thumbprint is available to the world. But once you're gone, the world loses something great because the, the world loses a first time and one time experience. Uh, have you recognized that no one can touch the world like you can touch the world? Because no one has the print that you have. So when I place my hand on this podium, I know that this podium is feeling a touch it's never felt before. 
And it's not particularly because there is something holy about me as a person. It's just strictly because I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. See, I am an only copy. You won't find anyone like me anywhere else on the planet. Now, there are certain people who may remind you of me, uh, but as we say in the streets, I am often imitated but never duplicated because I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. See, my thumbprints carry the proof of my unique calling that when God manifested himself through me, I am a unique idea that originated in God's mind. That as the stars are different, the billions of stars, as snowflakes that fall, there is no common flake. So too with every human that comes out of the womb, they are fearfully and wonderfully made. Why? Because there's no one made like you. And the proof of this can be found on the palm of your hand. And I think God put it on the palm of your hand because you're supposed to do something. You're supposed to touch something. You're supposed to change something. You're supposed Amen. to shift yeah, something yeah. that nobody else yeah, can shift. Yeah, yeah. No one's been able to shift it before you and nobody will be able to shift it after you. Yeah. Why? Because you are fearfully Amen. and you are wonderfully made. Yeah, I don't know yeah. if you're with me yet yeah, yeah. but the proof is on the palm of your hand. Amen. See, God put a barcode on everybody's hand. Now, when I go to the store Amen. and they bleep a product using the barcode, it's registered in a system to show which product I I have purchased at that unique moment and time. So whenever I come into contact with another human being, with, with another thing that God has created, whenever I come into contact with this planet, there is a barcode that is registered with the universe, yeah. and immediately my unique and wonderful identity is registered in the collective consciousness of yeah. this planet. Yeah. See, I've Amen. been fearfully yeah. and wonderfully yeah. made. Yeah. I don't need your affirmation. I don't need you to tell me that I'm right. I don't care if you think that I'm wrong, because the proof is on the palm of my hand. I am something special. I am something worthwhile. You'll never see anything like me again. No, I'm not being arrogant. I'm just being biblical. God has given me permission to champion his thought process, his creativity. For it is God in me that gives me hope for glory. And God's presence in my life is right here on the palm of my hand. Amen. See, but the thing is, some of y'all are still being quiet because you don't believe me. <laughs> uh, you hear me talking about myself, but you feel that that is disconnected from your own purpose. And maybe here is where we see the devil's greatest work. The devil's greatest work is not found in the battling of demons. The devil's greatest work is not to get you to go to the club or take in some type of substance that you should not be consuming. The devil's greatest work is not to get you to commit adultery or fornication. The devil's greatest work is not even to have you look at the sky and say, I want to do life my way. I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. See, in church, we talk about those things as if that's the devil's greatest work. But that's not the devil's greatest work. As a matter of in fact, you only do those things because there's something missing on the inside of you. And the only reason that we sin is because the devil has been able to disrupt how we see ourselves. Can I prove it to you from the text? Because in Genesis chapter 3, it is very clear that the, verse, the very first sin committed by Eve was not a sin out of, of this pride or vain glory. It was not a sin simply of just wanting to eat something because she was hungry. The sin was caused because the devil convinced her that what God made was defective. Right, right, right. That God's work wasn't complete yet. That she was not in effect fearfully or wonderfully made. But there were some things she had to do to add to God's thought process. His creative ideal. And when he convinced her that what God did is not good, that's when she reached to the tree. Notice the Bible says she saw the tree and said this is good. Right. Now isn't that interesting? That first he has to convince you to see yourself as not good for him to get you to see sin as good. Well maybe the inverse will also be true. That if you finally see that what God made is good, right. then you would start to see those sins as not 
good when Paul says the things I do are the things I don't want to do and the things that I end up doing or excuse me the things I don't want to do those are the things I end up doing what Paul is really talking about is I have a deep seated identity crisis and that's why in Romans chapter 12 he says you want to know how you can be changed well you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind see this whole Bible is talking about a psychological problem that all of us have on the planet you have forgotten that you are fearfully and wonderfully made amen Yes. And what I think we have to do more of in our churches, we have to start building up each other's identity. Yes. See, yes. I've heard the yes. sermons that talk about uh, the heart of man is infinitely, infinitely wicked. Who can know it? I've heard the sermons that you are a wretch undone. I've heard the sermons that you are filled, that you are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. I've heard those, those sermons, but I haven't heard enough sermons about how God sees me, what God made when he thought about me. But my Bible says that I have plans for you, yeah. thoughts of good and not of evil, yeah. to give you a hope and a future. Yeah. Yeah. When are we going to start talking about yeah. how God hey. sees us? Hey. I'm here to tell you just one simple sentence. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. But but maybe we need to pivot at this point and discuss why we don't believe that anymore. Maybe we need to get some practical psychology. Maybe we need to transform this church into a psychology session. Because I don't think that your transformation can happen just with Jesus. Period. No, I'm not going to fix it. Some of y'all have said he's going to fix it. <laughs> fix that preacher. No, I said what I meant, and I meant what I said. See, we have been trained that all we need to be renewed and transformed is Jesus. But I got news for you. What you need is Jesus and therapy. No, what you really need is Jesus and therapy. And we got a lot of stigmatizing about going to psychologists and therapists and having them help us work through these deep-seated uh, mental breakdowns that we've had. See, many of y'all don't recognize that the reason you can't overcome in your spiritual life is because you haven't dealt with the trauma that you faced when you were a child. You haven't dealt with the things that happened to you that weren't your fault. You haven't thought, dealt with the things that happened to you just as an outgrowth of living in a sinful world and right. a sinful context. Right. See, I don't look at you and see someone who's disgusting and dirty and despondent and destroyed and, and discouraged. I don't see those things. Right. What I really see is someone who is hurt, yeah. who needs some help, yeah. who's trying to work yeah. through things to yeah. the best of their ability. Right. Yes, they made some mistakes, but they are still fearfully yeah. and wonderfully yeah. Yeah. As I read the passage of scripture today, Psalms 139, I think David is trying to tap you on the shoulder. See, these were songs written for other people to sing. Whenever we read the songs, we need to see this as a praise and worship hymnal. That as this song was sung, not read, but as the song was sung, it would be sung by everyone who came into the congregation. So when David writes this lyric, you might think he's just talking about himself. And then you might walk away from the reading and say, man, David was fearfully and wonderfully made, but he was a king. He defeated a giant. God loved him. He was a man after God's own heart, etc., etc." But that's not how you should read this passage. This passage would have been sung, which means anyone who was reading it would have been declaring it over themselves. And that's why I love the ministry of David, because the Bible is clear that he learned a secret of spiritual warfare. David learned to encourage himself right. in the Lord. So when I look at the passage, I say, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. No, I'm not talking about David. I'm talking about Michael Blake. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well Michael Polite knows it. You watched Michael Polite being formed in utter seclusion as Michael was woven together in the dark of his mother's womb. You saw Michael before he was born. Every day of Michael's life was recorded in your book. 
every moment was laid out before a single day was lived by Michael. See, and then I read it back to myself and I use words like I and me and that's how I come to the conclusion that when David says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, he is not meaning for you to hear how confident he is in his own relationship with God. He's trying to get you to step into a space where you would start encouraging yourself in the Lord. Amen. So I want you to turn to your neighbor right now and say, I am fearfully. fearfully. Turn to your other neighbor and say, and I am wonderfully. wonderfully. Now look up into the sky and say, made. Made. See, I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. See, we're all supposed to be singing the song, but here are three reasons why it's hard for you, even now, even in this moment, why you can say these words, but it doesn't really settle deep in your soul. Here's the first thing that the enemy did to you at some point in your life. Most likely this one happened when you were very young. I'm talking about between the ages of three to seven. This psychological wound happened to you. It happened through abuse. It happened through neglect. It happened through abandonment. Something bad happened to you. It happened through violence. It happened uh, through a death. Something bad happened that caused this to set in your mind. Notice David says, your workmanship is marvelous. Mm. But at some point in your childhood, you began to think that I'm not marvelous. Mm. Every child when they're first born, you just watch them, especially when they hit about the age of two, they walk around like they're marvelous. (laughs) I have a two-year-old son, I understand it. My son walks around as if he's marvelous. He thinks that he knows what needs to happen, when it needs to happen, and how it needs to happen. He points over here and says, Daddy, you need to come over here with me. He points over there, Daddy, you need to go over here with me. And then if I don't come, he yells at me as if it's me that has the problem and not him that has a problem. All children are born thinking they're marvelous. It's life that teaches them they're not. It's the abandonment of a father that says you're not marvelous. It's the neglect of a mother that told you you're not marvelous. It's the abuse from an auntie or an uncle that showed you you're not marvelous. It's the violence in your neighborhood that hits your family that tells you you're not marvelous. It is the betrayal of a brother or a sister that told you you're not marvelous. It's granddaddy or grandmama not being able to deal with their bitterness and passing down that bitterness to you that convinced you you're not marvelous. The first thing the enemy does to every human that comes out the womb is he sets up a plan to convince you you're not marvelous. Mercy, mercy. And that's why you struggle to worship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The people who find the secret of worship are the people who understand the secret of their identity. Worship is supposed to come out of a natural appreciation for what God has done. But we think it's enough to appreciate what God does outside of us while we hate on what God has done inside of us. You cannot appreciate your world until you appreciate yourself. You cannot appreciate your world until you appreciate yourself. So as long as you hate yourself, you actually can't love a spouse well. You actually can't get in a romantic relationship and love someone the way that they are supposed to be loved because you haven't learned to love yourself. See, the Bible is trying to give you a hint that the love for another person is not fully about you simply projecting some type of God-like ideal on your external environment because it says love thy neighbor as you love yourself. God knows the secret of psychology. The more you hate yourself, the more you'll hate other people. The more you distrust yourself, the more you'll distrust other people. The more you think you're disgusting, the more you'll think life is disgusting. The secret of this book, the secret of what's going on in your mind is you hate yourself so there's no way you can love your creator. And until you get to the place where you start saying, I'm marvelous, you will not be able to overcome some of the challenges in your life. 
Now, this is not to say you won't go to heaven. There are many people who will be in heaven who never overcame this great challenge. Mm. But that is because with sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Right. Yeah. That's what Romans says. And I receive that in my innermost parts. What I'm trying to give to you is how to increase your quality of life while you're on the planet. And while you're on this planet, you will never be able to fulfill your God-given potential until you start looking at what God has made and declaring it is good. Because as I read the creation story, after God made everything, he declared, I think this is good. And until you come into alignment, until you come into agreement with what God has spoken over your own life, there's no way you can receive what God has desired to give. Amen. Amen. And there's no way you can accomplish what God has desired to do Amen. until you think, I'm marvelous. Right. There's a reason why you can't see your marvelous, and it's revealed in verse 15. You see how the Bible says that God was there watching as I was formed in utter seclusion, this version says, and crafted and shaped in total darkness. Now, you didn't catch it, but let me translate it for you. Did you notice how the Bible says, you watch me as I was molded in loneliness and I had to grow in darkness. I was molded in loneliness and I had to grow in darkness. Now, some of you didn't see this, but it really, this text Pat points us back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, where it says God was with our planet in the beginning. However, the planet was in total darkness, and it was void, it was empty, it was lonely. So God was in a dark place, watching something that was chaotic and, and dark try to find itself. And that's where God stepped into the space and said, let there be light. And now our planet is starting to be birthed in the universe. But notice, this is where the encouragement comes in. Even if you feel lonely, even if you can't find support, even if you haven't heard any encouragement, even if you feel all by yourself, God can still make something awesome out of your life. Amen. 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 See, when I read the story of Genesis, I look at a planet that was made from nothing. Now, this is very important because some people say it was made out of nothing. I say, no, 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 no. I, I disagree with that. It was actually made out of emptiness. And it was crafted out of darkness. Yeah. It was made out of something. It was something that you couldn't see. It was made out of emptiness and crafted out of darkness. God can take your emptiness and he can take your, 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 he can take your darkness and he can actually make something beautiful out of it. And here's where the devil gets all of us. He gets in your ear and starts saying nobody loves you. Right. Nobody appreciates you. Yeah. Nobody values you. Right. And as soon as you start thinking that, you don't see yourself as marvelous. Right. And if that doesn't work, then he starts reminding you of how dark your life is. <laughs> how many mistakes you've made. How far away you feel from God. How many things are imperfect in you. Right. But I came to declare here at Jordan Street today yeah. that he is a master yeah. at crafting yeah. things out of darkness yeah. and molding yeah. things out of emptiness yeah. and loneliness. Yeah. My God is not in bed by my darkness. But the word of God says the spirit of God moved upon the face of the darkness. God doesn't mind my darkness yeah. and he's willing to work with my loneliness. Yeah. He is still going to birth something in me even if I don't feel like I have something to give. Yeah. Thank you God. God is going to birth something in me even if I don't have something to give. Thank you. The planet never had anything to give to God. Mm. But God had everything to give to the planet. Yes. And the planet is now a place where life can be found. Right. Not because the planet pulled itself out of darkness. <laughs> Not because the planet built a network with other planets. No, in fact, the planet is a place where life can be found. Mm. Simply because God came near to it. Right, that's it. I'm marvelous. Mm -hmm. I do feel lonely. And many times I'm challenged by my own darkness. Right. Right. Yes. But I am still fearfully right. and wonderfully made. Amen. Yes. Oh, but here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. The pain that you've gone through in your life has created a faith crisis. Mm. Faith is a substance. 
of things we're hoping for. It's future. Evidence of things we haven't seen. Future. It is impossible to please God without faith. This is why your greatest expression of faith is to look in the mirror each day and say, I'm marvelous. Even if you haven't seen it yet, even if you're still searching for it, you got to start there because you can't love your world until you love yourself. Amen. Now, the issue is, though, that the pain of your days has caused you to accept a lot of these negative messages. Mm. Many of you don't even recognize the depth of the voices that are causing you to make certain decisions. Mm. We have two spheres of our brain, well, actually three. One sphere is just over the functions, it's called the functional brain. That is over your breathing. Like right now, some of you are not thinking, I have to breathe. Breathe again, <laughs> breathe again. No, you all are not actively thinking that. That is the functional aspect of your brain. Then there's the conscious aspect of your brain, which is what's taking in all the information and data from your surroundings. But the, the function and the conscious feed one important sector called subconscious. It's a part of your brain you don't realize is at work. However, who you are is actually found in your subconscious, not in your conscious. Yes. If I really want to know who you are, then I got to get down to the voices that are at play in your head that not even you have an understanding of, not even you can recognize because they're very subtle. For example, some of you have an immediate aversion to a certain type of food. Right. Certain type of food, you see it and you get nauseated. <laughs> Who's making you sick in that moment? It's not your conscious mind. Your conscious mind would say, well, we have to taste it to see if this is as bad as the last one that we tasted that was like this, right? It's not your conscious mind. Your conscious mind is only doing research, but you're already sick and you haven't done research. It's not your functional mind, because your functional mind is ready to take it and digest it and distribute it throughout your body. It's not your functional mind. It's your subconscious mind right. that has a memory of some time where this didn't go well. Right. And it decides to remind you of who you actually are. Mm. That you don't respond well to this item of food, so you should not take it. And just in case you decide to use your conscious mind and try to figure something out, I'm going to make you so sick that you don't get near it. It is your subconscious mind that controls you. And what, I, what I'm reading in the Bible is, oh my goodness, all of this stuff has been pre-programmed into me. It's Black History Month. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Do you know that many of your responses to life aren't even based upon your lifetime? Mm -hmm. That psychologists have now discovered something called a transgenerational script. All a transgenerational script is, is the things that you respond to that aren't based upon your lifetime, but based upon the lifetimes that are flowing in your veins. Right. Mm -hmm. That there are many things that you do every day that you don't actually decide to do, mm. but they are given to you as a natural response to your environment, that, and that lifetime was lived decades ago. Hundreds of years ago, you're still living out the lifetimes and the traumas of those who lived hundreds before your time. What I'm trying to tell you is this issue of getting the victory over yourself is way deeper than anyone could ever think. And so many of you look at your life and where it's going, the trajectory of it, and you look at God and you feel this immense pressure. Am I going to measure up to God's uh, expectations? Am I going to meet his standard? I don't know if I can do it. I got all of this stuff inside of me that I don't understand. I don't know where I'm going on most days. I'm confused. I want to do the right thing, but it doesn't feel natural to me. How is God going to overcome all of that? How can I be marvelous when I feel so confused? But did you read the passage of scripture, 139 and verse 16? That before you were born, all of your days had already been lived out before God before you lived one of those days. Now what I'm not trying to say is that God now makes all your decisions for you. God simply has the foreknowledge into the future. See, with God, there is no past, present, or future. There's only present. That's why we say he lives in eternity. All eternity is is a realm with no time. You need past. You need time to have a past. You need time to have a future. And the only reason we keep time is because we die. We only log time so we can see how long we lived. 
Because we expect to die. But if you don't expect to die, why would you check the time? <laughs> you got all the time you need. No time's running out. So in God's realm, there is no time. So watch this. And I pray this revelation blesses your heart. In God's realm, he has already lived out your life with you. He has seen it all happen because everything is currently present with God. That's why he tells Moses, tell them I am the great I am. He does not say I'm the great I was or the great I will be. He says I'm the great I am. Everything is present before me. That's all you need to know. I've seen it all. I've walked through it. Through, I've walked through it all with you. So when it says that God has seen every day of your life, when you fail, you are still meeting God's expectations. Now I know that didn't rest well with some of you because you've been indoctrinated in a religion that makes you feel like you have to earn God's favor. But there's something you can do to get into the right space with God. You missed Ephesians when it says you are saved by grace through faith and not of your works lest anyone should boast. No one who gets to heaven will say, I'm here because I did this, and I'm here because I changed that. All of us will stand before the throne and declare, I don't know how I made it, but I'm glad I did. It is the glory of the Lamb that saved me. Understand that when you sin, when you mess up, you actually meet God's expectations. Did not Jesus tell Peter, listen, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. So when, when Peter denied Christ, he didn't let God down. God knew exactly what was going to happen. When Peter messed up, he met God's expectations. But God then told Peter, but I have prayed for you. And when you are converted, I'm going to use you to strengthen your brethren. And so it was seen later that that same Peter preached a sermon and saved that 3,000 people in one call to baptism. God is never disappointed by what you do because he saw that you were going to do it before you did it. What disappoints God is when he reveals his love to you. And you're unwilling to extend that love to somebody else. Which is why the Lord's Prayer says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. See, the whole standard of judgment is simply this. Can you accept that you need help? And are you willing to extend the same help once you receive it? Say it. Say it. Say it. That's judgment. But God knew you were flawed. Right. Yep, yep. Every day of your life that you will live on this planet has already been seen by God. Yeah. He's lived it with you already because there is no future. Everything you've done in the past, he expected you to do it. And all he's trying to do is convince you that in spite of all of that, you are still fearfully and wonderfully made. That he still has a plan. Because he saw it all before, he can make any adjustment midstream. <laughs> and he's just waiting to see if you will live a life of faith right. that starts with one thought. I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. Amen. As a musician begins to play. Amen. The three weapons that I struggle to use each day is to say that I am marvelous, that God can use my darkness and loneliness to make something beautiful, and that in spite of how I feel,